Mm. On Larry King Now, Nate Berkus and Jeremiah Brent. The connective tissue with our show, Nate and Jeremiah by Design, is love. And so we wanted to create a show that was really about love and exposing people in the rest of the country to our love story, um, where a lot of people don't see anything that looks like us, that, you know, raising children. And, um, you know, we show love through design. I'm more of a traditionalist, I think, in my approach. Um, whereas Jeremiah throws out every rule, he's not burdened by some of that. I, I have a little too much information sometimes. So, you know, Jeremiah is much more modern in his approach. Plus, I got a campaign on to bring back linoleum. <laughs> You're alone. It's very durable. Good luck. I'll tell you that. Linoleum. No, linoleum's linoleum having a comeback. The floor never wears sure. out. It's coming back. <laughs> just... All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Today, my guests are Nate Burkus and Jeremiah Brent. Nate is the famed interior designer known for his work with Oprah Winfrey. He's authored two New York Times best-selling books and has had product lines with some of the biggest retailers in America, including Living Spaces. Nate's partner in business and life, Jeremiah Brent, is also a very successful interior designer, started his own design firm in 2011, went to work alongside Rachel Zoe, and was the host of his own homemade simple on OWN. Nate and Jeremiah now have a successful show together. It's called Nate and Jeremiah by Design. Brilliant. <laughs> Season three is currently airing on TLC. What brought you two together? You know, it's interesting. I mean, we were, I was living in New York. Jeremiah was living here in California. And we had a bunch of mutual friends, including Rachel Zoe, that Jer worked for. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to date each other even though we knew each other. Um, in fact, we had a, a weekend in New York or a day on, on a Saturday planned. And Jer came over and the, the, the pitch was, come over, I'll show you some of the vintage sources and things like that in Manhattan. Shown. And we've been together ever since. So I think, you know, I've been lucky to have great love twice in my life. My former partner died in the, in, in the, in the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. Um, and I know great love for me at least, when I feel it. And so that's, that's, and here we are today, two kids later and five years past. And you're still hooked up with Oprah? I am. I mean, <laughs> hooked up is a, you know, it, am I invited to dinner still? Yes. Um, I've actually moved in on her. She's yeah, my new girlfriend. Jer Jeremiah's kind of trumped that. Is the role. show you do together an Oprah show? No, it's not. It's yeah. on, uh, it's on uh, TLC and it's produced actually by the Property Brothers. Yeah. How, um, how did that come about, that show? You know, when we were, when we met and we obviously fell in love and had the, the opportunity to get married, which was legalized the year before we were married in New York City, and then we had our kids, we understood that there was actually, you know, something that we needed to do more. The connective tissue with our show, Nate and Jeremiah by Design, is love. And so we wanted to create a show that was really about love and exposing people in the rest of the country to our love story, um, where a lot of people don't see anything that looks like us, that, you know, raising children. And, um, you know, we show love through design. How, how does love affect design? Well, I think that, you know, it's interesting. I've been at this for over 23 years, and there is an inherent power in our environments when we feel good about how we're living. And this is universal. Any country, whether you're rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants to live better. I think it's a universal truth. And so when you see a family, when we have the opportunity to go into these people's homes and understand their story and how they find themselves in these really awful situations, and change that by making the home base a soft place to land, then there's a lot that's born from that. The relationships change, the tension shifts, people don't stress out and, and, and fear coming home after a long day of working or raising children or whatever it is. So we have an opportunity to sort of step in and kind of write a new chapter for their lives. Like architects, interior designers are very opinionated, <laughs> often go off because they get angrier do you two fight? Um, not when he listens to me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you have to really love the it's person It's a very that you're with. individualistic thing. Isn't it, it, it is, well, but there's never one way to do a room correctly. Exactly. And that was my big ego check, I think, when Jared yeah. and I started working together professionally. It's, you know, I was calling the shots for years in makeovers on television and with Oprah and all of those things. And 
I, I, I wasn't used to asking someone's permission whether or not I could paint a wall a certain color. So I've shifted as a person, and the truth is I think we do our best work together. Yeah, and I think there's design from an ego standpoint and yeah. business, and then there's design from a much more, you know, uh, emotional, psychosymptomatic standpoint, which is where we're at. I'm interested in the connection with the people. What are the moments that you live? How do we translate that? Obviously, it's through my lens, um, but I don't pretend to have all the answers. It's the client, not you, right? Yeah, it's not about us. It's, exactly. an, ego, it, it's not an ego-based exercise. If you're really a good listener and you really care about the people that you're sitting with, then you have an opportunity to, to translate something for them. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, how we view ourselves. Is there a particular area of expertise that is each your own? <laughs> like, in other words, no. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll give you an course. example. I like to handle the room look, the paint mm -hmm. yeah. thing. Sure. Uh, d d d d coffee tables aren't my thing. Yeah. yeah. I think my, my, my work experience and my career to date blends into what we do in my way. Um, I worked for an auction house. I understand antiques. I understand the history of furniture. I'm fascinated by that. I have hundreds of books about that. So I'm more of a traditionalist, I think, in my approach. Um, whereas Jeremiah throws out every rule, he's not burdened by some of that. I, I have a little too much information sometimes. So, you know, Jeremiah is much more modern in his approach. Um, and I tend to do things after this many this amount of time sort of in a similar fashion. Do you work with architects? Yep. Yeah, I work with everybody. Are they the boss or you're the boss? It's an ex a collective experience. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, we are very heavy handed with the way we navigate projects, whether it's on the show or in our own design businesses, because we have a vision that we're trying to bring to life for these clients. It's about dreaming a bigger dream for them. Um, and like I said, we're emotionally connected to everything, whether it's our personal projects or the show. How do you choose the people who appear on the show? Typically, we cast people who have found themselves underwater in a renovation. They have run out of money, they've run out of time, and they've lost control. They may have have had a bad experience with a contractor. They may not be able to, uh, you know, agree on what they want the home to actually be, um, which is which is where we step in. Okay, you do transformations, right? You yeah. change things around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it high risk? I think you know all of these. The, ex the collective experience in the show has been really understanding that you're always one bad decision away from a money pit, and watching these people's experiences and how they make these decisions. And so our job has really been about educating um, through the show and showing people how to actually. You watch these design shows and they do something over the weekend. And you're like, I can do that. I'm going to rip my bathroom out, and that's not how it works. Um, so <laughs> it's really about educating people. When we return, Nate and Jeremiah on how they met, what got them into interior design, make sure to check out the season three of their TLC show, Nate and Jeremiah by Design, and we'll be right back. All right, let's go. Let's go find him. Where's puppy? Mr. Moo! We thought as new parents that it was going to be a very similar process to when our daughter was born and we didn't do anything for six weeks and we stayed at home and we just ate cinnamon rolls every morning and looked at our new baby. We're still but eating cinnamon rolls. Oh. Is he going to get you? Get her! It's different when you have two kids because yeah. life doesn't stop. Hey Pops, are you excited about school today? You are? Who are you going to play with? See you later. Eddie? Bye, Aki. Is Eddie your boyfriend? <laughs> no, babe. She doesn't have boyfriends. She's going to yes, be. I do. Yes, no. she does, Dad. You're going to be married to me for the rest of your life. <laughs> All right, Daddy. I will get married with Eddie and you. No, no, not Eddie. Yeah. You're not going to marry anybody. Eddie is a big part of this. <laughs> We're back with Nate Burkus and Jeremiah Brent, two successful stories in the world of design and in the world of life at home as well. You were the first same-sex couple to be married at the iconic New York Library. How did you arrange that? It was great. So we, um, we didn't think we could afford to be married at the New York Public Library. <laughs> and we, had, we worked with a woman named Marcy Bloom in New York who's an old friend, wedding planner. And our big concept for our wedding was going to be a Brooklyn abandoned warehouse. And so we went to tour all these abandoned warehouses right on the river. And we were stepping in puddles and like up to our knees, there were rats. It was, you know, then we got the estimate on how much it cost to bring a bathroom into one of those places. And we ended up going to the library and said, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing 
to get married somewhere where our children will always be able to visit. Yeah. And so we, we thought, oh, let's check this out. And the library actually really wanted us to get married there. They're the remote, people that right? worked there were adorable. And they, they campaigned for it. And we thought, this is a really special place. We walked into that library for the first time. I mean, I've been in there. I've always, been a, I've always loved the New York Public Library. But we walked in. It was just the opportunity and the idea that we could marry there. And I like, fell apart. It was Who officiated? Sherry Salata, the, um, a good friend of ours um, who used to run Harpo and Own and, um, is, um, and did a fantastic job. And um, her big sort of uh, sermon, I guess, if you will, mm -hmm. was let this be a moment where everyone in the room not only feels a love of what's happening, but views the world, shifts the way that they view the world. Let this be a moment where you take on these magical glasses and understand that what you're here and what you're witnessing is many, something. How many people there? 250? There's 250. I knew yeah. like 40 people. So I knew everyone perfect. else. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what got you into interior design? You first. My mom has, is an interior designer, so I, I grew up... Um, coming into the house with, you know, rooms changed and the wallpaper changed and fabric samples all over the place. And um, I, I always was very sensitive to my environment. I was always moving around my furniture as a kid in my room. Um, for my bar mitzvah years ago, my mother and stepdad gave me my own bedroom in the basement of our house <laughs> in Minnesota, and I thought it was the best gift in the entire universe. I, I graduated from college in, in Chicago went to work for Leslie Hyman Auctioneers, an auction house there, and started learning about furniture and decoration and the history of all those things and realized that that wasn't what was interesting to me. What was interesting to me wasn't necessarily just the history of a chest of drawers, but how you could put something modern or how you could combine that piece of furniture in a space and make everything really come to life. And so I started my firm in Chicago. It's still based in Chicago um, 23 years ago. Do you think there are natural designers, or is it you got to be taught? No, I think there are natural designers. I'm a natural designer. I grew up the same way. My mother loved design, but we would spend the weekends going to open homes and taking a look, and I loved it. And I used to imagine the way people, I could recreate the way people would live in the home. I would think, okay, that doesn't need to be a dining room. Someone should come downstairs. And I was much more emotionally connected to the idea. I didn't realize it could even be a career. And as fate would have it, you know, years later, um, I was working in fashion and I would be on these shoots with Rachel Zoe and there'd be this gorgeous model in diamonds and dresses on a sofa and I'd be obsessed with the Jean Prouvé sofa behind her and not the actual girl in the dress. And Rachel looked at me and she was like, this is not your passion. You care about furniture, you need to follow your passion. And she was right, and I did, and I've been lucky enough to be able to work in that ever since. But I think it's either something you can connect to on an emotional level or you don't. Is it a success? If the client says, I love it, yep. that's the only person you have to appeal to. That's it. It's a success if the client walks in and it looks like they've been living there forever. That's the best feeling. Yeah. When the client walks in and says, this is so me. When we return, Nate and Jeremiah on the biggest design trends right now. Plus, we'll get a, a little personal with a fun round of <laughs> If You Only Knew. Don't go away. back with the great designers, great family men. Nate Berkus and Jeremiah Brent, stars on television. They're in season three of Nate and Jeremiah by Design on TLC. You're very active for the LGBTQ community. Are you active in politics too? I'm, politics is my secret love of my life. If I wasn't doing design, I think I would have been in politics full time, Are you especially active? now. Do you support yeah. candidates? We do. We do. Especially now, it's more important than ever for people to speak up and be heard. Are you pessimistic at what you see? No. 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 Um, we're hopeful at what we see. Um, you know, I think it's very easy right now in our current climate to be pessimistic about, about a lot of things. Um, but we. We just came back from Tijuana. We were visiting the, the, the shelters at the border in Tijuana and trying to get an understanding of what is really happening there. Um, I think it's so hard right now for people to watch the newsreel and, and, and the ticker, and, and, and I think that there's been a lot of credibility that's been lost, and, and so people don't know what to believe, and so I think it's just we're doing a lot of hands-on 
first-hand experiences so yeah. we can see with our own eyes. I think it's just a call to consciousness. I mean, I, for the first time, at least in my lifetime, people are talking about politics when you go to dinner, they're having a conversation. You know, I think pen, change is a pendulum and it swung very aggressively one way in a beautiful way for eight years and we're definitely, I believe, in a dark chapter. But what was really interesting for me, somebody who lives and breathes news and politics every morning, I read everything, I, even Fox, um, and I realized how out of touch I even was with what was going on in a large part of this country. And people stopped talking to each other. So our commitment is to engage in the conversations and not go, I can't talk to you because I disagree with you. Okay, we play a little game of if you only knew. What's the biggest risk you ever took? Falling in love. Same. Strangest fan encounter. Oh, somebody wanted to do something inappropriate to my hair. Which um, I didn't realize was, this yeah, was it was a very graphic yes, was Twitter comment. Very specific audience. Yeah, yeah. Most challenging makeover. I think the most challenging makeover we did, um, or I've done, was the, we did it together, was for the Covenant House in Los Angeles, which is a shelter for, um, for homeless, homeless yeah. youth here in Hollywood. And we redid, Jeremiah redid the whole center, all their rooms with, with Oprah and, and Own. And then years later, we came back and redid their community room. But it needed to function in like 80 different ways. And we were very connected to the people there. So there was a lot of pressure. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. Childhood celebrity crush. My actual, it was Goldie Hawn, and I ended up having dinner with her in New York City, and I was, like, paralyzed, oh, so you know, 20 years with Oprah, and I couldn't speak out loud with Goldie Hawn, and then we started running lines from Overboard, the movie, yeah. with, which is one of my favorites, and was my Great dad's movie. favorite, yeah. and, it, and everything worked out. So who was your child? I mean, I'm going to say it was Oprah. I mean, and then meeting her years later, it was really pretty well, surreal. Last great book you read? Just Mercy. Um, just finished it last night. Um, it's a fantastic book from a, um, uh, written by an attorney who um, runs an organization to help people who are children who are convicted of felonies um, and sentenced to death or sentenced to life without parole. And um, it's a fantastic book. It was a New York Times bestseller. And your last great. book? I just finished The Beautiful No by Sherry Salata, which is the first memoir she's put about her career. And then before that was Michelle. Michelle. Obama's book. Something you can't live without. Kindness. Family. Design trend you love right now. Um, I think that there's been a movement because the world of design's become so saturated with information, just like fashion, that I think people are getting a little bit smarter and slowing down the process of decorating their homes and really picking things that resonate with them. So I like this focus on personalization mm -hmm. and thoughtfulness. I like that you can live beautifully, affordably now. Yeah. What's the first thing you do when you get out of bed in the morning? I meditate and I make a pot of coffee and go through it by myself. I get up at 4 a.m. before everybody's up. And I wait for the coffee. Biggest perk of being a celebrity? Um, I think, honestly, it's the connections. Like, you know, you're always one person away from a doctor you need to get in touch with. Yeah. If your kids are sick. Clout. Clout. It's, that's, that's what I think has been the most amazing thing. If you thing. could eat only one food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Pizza. Pizza all day long, every day. What Dairy Queen. Eat? One Dairy food. Queen. Dairy Queen. <laughs> no. That ain't bad. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. I, would, I like it hooked up on an IV. That's just, my worst just, nightmare. Just, yeah. IV. <laughs> just, IV just, Dairy just Queen. Just walk around. Lucky me. <laughs> <laughs> What's the luxury you can't live without? Our kids. Kids are a lug lower luxury? Yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit, I'm a little paranoid. Like, I, I go into, like, the sort of Jewish Virgo mode with everything, so... I like everything. I like insurance. I like the pool cover. I like all the safety stuff. Yeah, but we didn't think we were ever going to be able to have children, two gay men. So, you know, we were very conscious of the fact that... How did that you arrange it? Sur it we had surrogacy, yeah. And standing on the shoulders of a lot of people who did a lot of work for the last, you know, 50 plus years. So it feels like such a luxury and such a responsibility that I think we're always kind of very conscious did of. Did you watch the children born? Yeah. I pulled them both out. Yeah. Who cut the cord? I cut poppies and you and cut I cut Oscars. our sons. Yeah, I didn't want to be in the room for either, <laughs> ever for the first for our daughter. Yeah. I was terrified, and I said, "I'm just going to wait." And the nurses in the hospital here in the valley um, were so wonderful, and they looked at me and they said, "You're making an enormous mistake. We don't know you, but we can promise you, you're making an enormous mistake. Just come in the room, 
and we'll set you up up in the corner. And if you want to see, you can see, but be in the room. And Jeremiah looked at me and he said, if they turn and need, you need, if, if you draw their attention away from what's happening, for one reason, you need juice, you feel faint, I'm going to shoot you. I will kill you. Yeah. This so, is about the baby. But I, I've never been more grateful to have both you of those take experiences. The baby home. Yeah. yeah. In our final moments, great story. Nate Burkus and Jeremiah Brent will answer your social media questions. Stay with us on this edition of Larry King Now. We're back with the dynamic duo, Nate Burkus and Jeremiah Brent. What's the number one thing people stay, have in their homes that's outdated? Dried flowers. Ugh. Ugh. People love a dead flower. I for years, they leave it, it for 30 years on the fireplace. Like, Can you imagine what's living inside of that? No. What's an out. automatic that's never, that's always been part of interior design, always will? That's terrible or something that no, should no, always be? Always there. You know, listen, we've built our businesses on the idea that your home should tell your story, and the way you do that is through your things. And so I think one thing that we always bring into a project is something with age or some patina, like mixing the old with the new. We work with a lot of architectural salvage, we work with a lot of antiques, we look with a, work with a lot of vintage items. So I would say a universal is have something that has some meaning to you. Have something that was your mother's or you know something. What's the great. biggest trend out there now? I think trends are trendy, unfortunately. I mean, you know, Nate hates the word trend. It doesn't bother me because I think it keeps people engaged, but I don't think people should be fueled by them. You know, I, I think right now everybody's obsessed with wicker and lucite and whatever, but the truth is you're going to make your home look like the catalog, page 23, and then you're going to walk in the door and not see yourself in it. I got a campaign on to bring back linoleum. <laughs> You're alone. It's very durable. Good luck. I'll tell you that. Linoleum. No linoleum's linoleum having a comeback. The floor never wears sure. out. It's coming back. We just it's, <laughs> it is coming Don't back. Discount I'm not linoleum. supporting it. I'm not I'm supporting it. You I'm not arguing linoleum. with you. We have some social media questions. Hunt the air on Twitter. We love you guys. We live in a brand new fifth wheel on a beautiful property in Northern California. What can we do to make it more comfortable and homey? I don't know what a fifth wheel means. It's a trailer? It's a trailer, yeah. yeah. Okay. I know, because <laughs> <laughs> I've been in a few. <laughs> um, it's, I a think it's a trailer. It's a trailer, and I think you know a lot of them come prefab, so they already are redone. I think it's about, again, personalization, introducing finishes. I think with a fifth wheel, it's about texture. Wallpaper is a really great friend there. Removable wallpaper, which is a great yeah. uh, product that's out now. Um, and carpeting, because those are, most of them are carpeted. There's a lot of linoleum in them. Yes, so I'd be happy to hear. Linoleum can you make in. a trailer a home? You can. I think you can make anything a home. And you know, I'm on my fourth passport. I've 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 been around the world, and 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 I've experienced a lot of different cultures and what home means in all these different countries. And I think just because you're in a trailer doesn't mean you can't live beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, just because if you live in a yurt, you can live beautifully. I would add some things. I would add family photos framed on the wall. I would commit to things. That really tell the story of your family. I would, um, you know, if there's anybody that knits, make some pillows. You know, have things that you have a personal connection to. Jamie Jones on Facebook asks, "You have such great product lines. I love your furniture line and living spaces. You have any plans for more?" Yeah, we actually just launched a full breadth of the collection um, about two weeks ago, which is furniture for the bedroom, dining room, living room, again, with an emphasis on creating stuff that is not transactional or temporary, but things that you can buy at a, at a really affordable price point that you can have for a long time, yeah. which is our intention. We love product design. We can't go, we can't be in a city or uh, get off a plane and experience a new place without thinking how that can be translated mm -hmm. into a chest of drawers or a, a pattern on a sofa. So it's a, when, you, when you're in that zone, you're constantly looking you at things. You ever do uh, businesses? Yep. Yeah. Offices? Sure, all Everything. the time. Ben Hardwick on the Larry King Now blog. Do you see yourselves as role models for other gay men? How do you be, feel about having that responsibility? I, I definitely feel a responsibility um, to showcase um, and to continue the work of the LGBTQ advocates that have happened before us. Um, I'm still, I think, personally working on I don't know whatever a role model means, but yeah, I, I think we definitely feel like we have a responsibility to, to continue to move that needle forward. We're the only family currently, gay family like us, with two fathers on TV with two kids right now. 
That's it. On all the networks, on all the primetime, on cable, that we're the only ones. And so there is an, an inherent responsibility built into that. However, I think what what is more important than the responsibility to be a political role model is to be a human role model. And so we, what we put out there and how we behave on camera and off camera is, 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 a, is very important to us. It's not lost on yeah. us that people are paying attention to Plus when, I mean, when I, was, when, when I was growing up, gay on television, you were either sick or you've been ostracized. And so to actually be able to create a different narrative as a family with that you know is rooted in love, that are working hard and doing their best to raise kids, it's just nice to showcase that for some other kid out there who's like, what does this look like for me if I tell my parents tonight? And we were at The Grove here in LA the other day and we got out of the elevator with both kids, strollers, the whole nightmare, diaper bags, the whole story. And a lady stopped us out of the elevator and said, I, I never do this, I just wanted to say to you both that my son just came out to me three days ago and my biggest fear was that he wouldn't have an opportunity to have a family and children and your show was playing in the background. And I just wanted to say thank you because I realized that it was my own perception that, the, that what you've created for your family and your life wouldn't be possible for my son and I was reminded seeing you with your children that anything is possible. And you're gonna to have to explain to them why they have two fathers. We do, yeah, yeah we, we will. Trust me, she's very aware of it. She had a girlfriend, a little friend yesterday, who's like, where's your mom? And she goes, I don't have one. <laughs> Positively Pax on Twitter. What are your thoughts on painting brick? I love brick, but it seems like everyone is painting their brick homes or fireplaces white. I don't mind painting brick if you want to paint it brick, mm -hmm. but I, again, what makes me nervous about that question is, he, they're seeing what everyone is doing. And we're much more interested in what you think is the best look for your family. Brick can be beautiful, and if that's what you like, leave it. Mm -hmm. One more thing, Carl Monroe on Facebook. Jeremiah used to work for Rachel Zoe. What was that experience like? Was it hard to go from working from someone else to managing everything yourself? Oh my God, it was so hard. It was so hard and so awful, but the rest was in the purpose. I sold everything I own my car and everything to buy my LLC. I worked out of my living room with just one glass desk that I found. <laughs> um, but if you're lucky enough to work in your passion and love what you do, which I'm very fortunate, I wake up thinking about design, we go to bed thinking about design, it's the best reward and it works out. Big thanks to my guests, Nate Burkus and Jeremiah Brent. You can see them both in Nate and Jeremiah by Design, currently airing Saturdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on TLC. And as always, you can find me on Twitter at Kings Things. I'll see you next time.